Hi everyone, my name is Laura McCarter. Today I'll be going through a few poems by John Keats in the hopes of shedding some light on how you can analyze his poetry for yourself. I will be using one of his sonnets, When I Have Fears That I May Cease to Be, one of his ballads, La Belle Dame Sans Merci, and one of his odes, Ode to a Nightingale. There is one important thing that you should remember while reading any poetry, especially Keats. Just because Keats wrote the poem and it seems very personal, that does not mean that it is him speaking in the poem. It is often believed that Keats was the speaker in many of his poems, and he is a speaker in a number of them, but that should not always be assumed. Keats had a concept that he applied to his work called negative capability. This concept is one of the key elements of Keats's poetic process. According to Linda von Fall, this process begins with a desire for self-fulfillment and a psychological openness that enables the poet to experience other people and objects by assuming their characteristics. Keats termed this acquisition of characteristics of others negative capability. Through this, he was able to become sensitive to the experience of people in other situations. It allowed him to feel more of both the pleasure and pain of human experience, and it allowed him to write poetry from many different perspectives. By understanding the experiences of these other people, he was able to portray a more accurate picture in his poetry and also give him a better understanding of the world around him. To begin, you should always try and read the poem aloud in order to appreciate it more, and also to make sure you are paying attention to certain aspects of poetry that you wouldn't catch if you don't hear it aloud, such as the meter of the poem. I'll be reading each of the poems aloud that I am analyzing. Let's get started. First we have the sonnet, When I Have Fears That I May Cease To Be. When I have fears that I may cease to be, before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain, before high-piled books and character hold like rich garners the full ripened grain, when I behold upon the night's starred face, huge cloudy symbol of a high romance, and feel that I may never live to trace their shadows with the magic hand of chance, and when I feel, fair creature of an hour, that I shall never look upon thee more, never have relish in the fairy power of unreflecting love, then on the shore of the wide world I stand alone and think, till love and fame to nothingness do sink. Before we jump into the analysis of the poem, let's briefly discuss what's happening here. Keats was facing his death. Towards the end of life, he was living with the realization that he was going to die. He had medical experience as an apothecary and nursed his mother and brother as they died of tuberculosis. Being able to witness this firsthand allowed him to recognize the same symptoms in himself. He died in 1821 at the age of 26. This poem was written in 1818, only a few years before his death. Some of the terminology in these poems make comprehension difficult, so before we analyze what we've just read, we will go through some of the more difficult terms and get a better understanding. Gleaned means to gather slowly and laboriously, bit by bit, so this means that Keats had not yet uncovered everything his mind was capable of. Teeming is abounding or swarming with something, so his brain is full of untapped potential waiting to be used. Character is the use of characters or symbols for the expression of meaning, which I take as he has not yet put the metaphors that he sees in his mind into poetry yet. A garner is a store of supply of something, so a rich garner is an abundant supply. Fairy powers are referring to the experience of love here. Keats is saying that he will never be able to enjoy the powerful feeling of love after his death. This poem is, as I said earlier, a sonnet. This means that the poem has 14 lines of 10 syllables, and each line is written in iambic pentameter. Iambic means that the syllables are alternating, unstressed followed by stressed. The lines are pentameters, meaning that there are five feet, and each foot is created by one iamb. You can see the feet as well as the pattern of the iamb here. When I have fears that I may cease to be. And also, further down in the poem, their shadows with the magic hand of chance. Of course, I'm overly stressing the stressed syllables so, so that you can hear it better, but if you pay attention, you can hear it when reading it normally as well. These patterns signify that the poem is written in iambic pentameter. The rhyme scheme of the poem is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, meaning the alternating lines rhyme with each other. You can see this in the first quatrain. 
B and tree in italics here rhyme, and brain and grain rhyme underlined here. Let's now go on to a deeper understanding of the poem. The poem is only one stanza, which is an arrangement of a certain number of lines separated from the other stanzas of the poem, if there are more than one, forming the division of the poem. Stanzas are sort of like the equivalent of a paragraph for poetry. Although the sonnets are only one stanza, you can see a definite separation of this sonnet into smaller portions. It is made up of three quatrains and one couplet. A quatrain is four lines of poetry, and a couplet is two lines of poetry. The three quatrains differ from each other, and the poem progresses through them to get to the climactic ending in the final couplet. In the first quatrain, the protagonist is describing life's meaning in terms of autumn. This is clear by the imagery of gleaning his teeming brain as one would glean a harvest, and the image of rich gardeners holding the full ripened grain. This quatrain is implying that the protagonist fears dying before the reaping of the harvest, before poetic maturity has been achieved. The second quatrain goes from the entire season to a single night, in which the protagonist is beholding or observing a cloudy symbol of high romance and thinking that he may never trace the shadows of this romance with the magic hand of chance. These images are more abstract than the first quatrain. The speaker goes from talking about his poetry to talking about love and what he will miss out on romantically as if he is taken from life too soon. In the third quatrain, the sonnet becomes even more abstract. The protagonist is talking to a fair creature of an hour or a lover. The time units of the quatrains are becoming smaller as the poem progresses. The images also become more abstract with the fairy power of unreflecting love. In this quatrain, he begins talking about his lover specifically and the realization that when he dies, he will never look on her again. The speaker of the poem is moving outside the space-time dimension by using progressively smaller units of time, going from a season to a night, then to an hour. The speaker is also changing the quality of the images being used. The first quatrain has substantial concrete images, the second quatrain has more abstract images, and the third is even more abstract than the second. There is a reason for both of these movements. They are both moving in the direction of one particular word in the last line, nothingness. Time is getting shorter and the images are getting less substantial, fading into nothingness. This idea of nothingness is very significant to the understanding of the poem. Many critics have said different things about what this nothingness signifies. R.W. Stallman and Amy Lowell, for example, believe that Keats is talking about death with its melancholy threat to take away substantiality and meaningfulness from the individual. M. A. Goldberg, on the other hand, believes that Keats is being more complex than that. Nothingness in this poem can imply two different meanings. One, a physical reduction to zero, or a wasting away that death is capable of, or two, a reduction to insignificance. Goldberg says that it is not the protagonist that sinks to nothingness, but love and fame. The protagonist is actually able to ascend as a result of the sinking. He stands alone and thinks until this nothingness is achieved. He mentally wills himself to lose a concern for death, and in doing so, he has ascended above his fears. Nothingness could be a lack of substance, meaning that the concepts of love and fame are lacking the value they formerly held, or nothingness could be a lack of significance, meaning that love and fame have not changed, and the protagonist no longer holds them in high esteem as he did before. The reason for his fears were what he would lose in his death. He would not be able to achieve poetic fame, and he would be apart from his lover for the rest of eternity. By diminishing the value of these things in his mind, he becomes more able to face death without being afraid. Now let's look at a ballad, La Belle Dame Sans Merci. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, alone and palely loitering? The sedge has withered from the lake, and no birds sing. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, so haggard and so woebegone? The squirrel's granary is full, and the harvest's done. I see a lily on thy brow, with anguish moist and fever dew, and on thy cheeks a fading rose fast withereth too. I met a lady in the means, full beautiful, a fairy's child. Her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. I made a garland for her head, 
and bracelets too in fragrant zone. She looked at me as she did love and made sweet moan. I set her on my pacing steed and nothing else saw all day long. For sidelong would she bend and sing a fairy song. She found me roots of relish sweet and honey wild and manna dew. And sure in language strange she said I love thee true. She took me to her elfin grot, and there she wept and sighed full sore, and there I shut her wild, wild eyes with kisses four, and there she lulled me asleep, and there I dreamed, ah, woe betide, the latest dream I ever dreamt on the cold hillside. I saw pale kings and princes too, pale warriors, death pale were they all, they cried, La belle dame sans merci hath thee in thrall. I saw their starved lips in the gloom, with horrid warning gaped wide, and I awoke and found me here on the cold hillside. And this is why I sojourn here, alone and palely loitering, though the sedge is withered from the lake and no birds sing. This poem is a narrative, meaning it is telling an account of an event. There is a man walking by. He comes across a knight that seems to be very upset about something. The man asks the knight to tell him what has caused him such distress and the knight tells him a story of a beautiful woman, a fairy child, whom he has fallen in love with. He tells of their time together, then he tells of a dream he had that warned him against what the dream figures called La Belle Dame Sans Merci. When the knight awakes from his dream, he is in the sedges where the man has found him, and the poem comes full circle. Now let's look at some of the vocabulary we aren't so comfortable with for clarification. A sedge is any rush-like or grass-like plant that grows in wet places, so the knight is sitting on the side of the road in the wet grass, basically. Mead is an alcoholic liquor made by fermenting honey and water, but mead is also an archaic word for meadow. This creates an interesting double meaning. It seems that Keats is saying that he met the woman in the meadow, but it is possible to read it as saying that he met her while he was drunk. If this is the case, we have the potential for an unreliable narrator. We'll get to this more later. Fragrant zone refers to a belt he made for the Lady of Flowers, just as he made a garland for her head. Manna is any divine or spiritual food, so the woman has given him delicacies that seem to him divine. A grot is a cave or cavern. The elfin grot would have been a cave that perhaps seemed to have a magical element to it. Betide means to happen. By saying woe betide, the knight means that woe came upon him. La Belle Dame Sans Merci is French for the beautiful woman without mercy. Enthrall means enslaved, so La Belle Dame is holding the knight as somewhat of a slave. Gloam is an archaic word for twilight, so the knight was seeing the men of his dream in twilight. A sojourn is a temporary stay, so the knight was temporarily in the place where the man passing by found him. La Belle Dame Sans Merci is a ballad which is a simple narrative poem composed into short stanzas. These stanzas are quatrains, as we have looked at earlier. But instead of being iambic pentameter, the first three lines of each stanza are iambic tetrameter, and the last line is iambic dimeter. Tetrameter contains four feet of iams, and dimeter contains two feet of iams. The rhythm of the poem is the same, with the syllables being unstressed followed by stressed, but the lines are shorter. We can see this pattern in the first stanza. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, alone and palely loitering? The sedge has withered from the lake, and no birds sing. Each stanza follows the rhyme scheme A, B, C, B, meaning that the first and third lines do not rhyme, but the second and fourth lines do. This story is interesting, as it portrays a knight that is enthralled by a lady. In the same way, the reader is enthralled by the strangeness and eeriness of the poem. This is done on purpose to further emphasize those feelings of the night. This poem is very complex and can have many interpretations. By trying to determine exactly what the poem is trying to say, the reader becomes in a state of bondage to the poem as they try to find an absolute answer, just as the knight is in a state of bondage with the lady. There are a very large amount of interpretations possible for one single poem. Not everyone will read a poem the same way, and as long as the poem supports the claims being made, it is valid. I will go through a number of different interpretations of this poem. 
Barbara Johnson says that there is a chivalric misogyny in those who assume that the knight is enthralled to a seductress. Johnson looks at this passage and points out the ambiguity of it. She looked at me as she did love. This gives rise to an uncertainty of meaning for the lady's gazes. The line's meaning, as Johnson suggests, could be that she looked at me as if she did love, or she looked at me while or because she did love. This makes all the difference to whether we see the lady as a fatal seductress or not. The ambiguous qualities of this particular poem allow for many different perspectives. There are other ambiguities in this poem when it comes to the lady. One, that she told him she loved him in language strange. What makes this language so strange? Is it a part of her evil plan to seduce the man, or is she speaking fr strangely for another reason? Johnson says by the end of the poem it becomes impossible to know whether one has read a story of a knight enthralled by a witch, or of a woman seduced and abandoned by a male hysteric. By this, she means that it could be that the man has abandoned the lady because of his paranoia that she was an evil seductress, when in reality she is innocent and the knight has only hurt her. We are only able to hear what the knight is saying to the man, and that story he tells has holes in it. We never see the lady actually do something to drive him away. All that occurs is a bad dream, and the knight no longer is with his lady. This is only one reading of the poem. It is possible to read a poem and find a completely different meaning than what another person, even a scholarly critic, has found. As long as the text can support your analysis, you aren't wrong. According to Gary Farnell, Johnson's interpretation that I just went over is not at all a common interpretation of the poem. It is, however, unique and opens up new possibilities for analyzing the poem. When I read this poem, I personally don't read it in this way, but she does find areas in the text that support her claim, and therefore her arguments are just as valid as the common interpretation. To further show the flexibility of poetic interpretation, I will share with you one interpretation that I have found while reading La Belle Dame sans Merci. I have not found any other critics who have pointed this out in my research, but that is not to say that it is not out there. This is only a disclaimer to you. I am not an expert, only a reader. Most of what I present to you in this video is backed up by other scholars. My reading of the poem has led me to believe that the knight could have been drunk. The double meaning of the word needs that I pointed out earlier has put it into my head that this could be a man who passes out incredibly drunk and dreams of this lady. She almost seems as if she could be a dream. The knight describes her as a picture of perfection and almost as if she was the perfect woman that his mind created. He met her in the meads, in the alcohol, and imagined his entire adventure with her. Before he woke from his booze-induced slumber, his dream turned negative and he saw the pale faces of men warning him against la belle dame sans merci. The knight was dreaming of his perfect woman at the same time that he was experiencing subconscious fears regarding love. The knight's dream is another very important part of the poem that raises more questions and uncertainty. Farnell claims that his dreaming constitutes a form of wish fulfillment, namely the wish to face up to unpleasant experience. The functioning form of wish fulfillment here has to do with the knight's wish to face up to and indeed free himself from the sexual desire to which, following his encounter with the lady, he feels himself enchained. Many critics have noted that the lady the knight becomes enamored with may not be the same as La Belle Dame. The lady may only be an instrument of La Belle Dame's merciless designs upon men. In this instance, La Belle Dame would be representative of womanhood and the power women have over men. The knight could be experiencing the uncontrollable emotions of feeling love for the first time. As you can see, all of these interpretations and more can be seen in this poem. The fact that this story is being told second-handedly by the man that saw the knight on the hill also creates more ambiguity. We have a potential unreliable narrator in the knight, since we are able to see flaws in his story regarding the truth of the lady and the possible altered state of his own mind. Now, let's go on to our final poem, Ode to a Nightingale. My heart aches, and a drowsy numbness pains my sense, as though of hemlock I had drunk, or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past, and leithwards had sunk. Tis not through envy of thy happy lot, 
but being too happy in thine happiness, that thou, light-winged dryad of the trees, in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease. O oh, for a drought of vintage, that hath been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green, dance and provincial song and sunburnt mirth. O oh, for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true, the blushful hippocrene, with beaded bubbles winking at the brim, and purple stained mouth, that I might drink and leave the world unseen, and with thee fade away into the forest dim. Fade far away, dissolve and quite forget what thou among the leaves hast never known, the weariness, the fever, and the fret, here where men sit and hear each other groan, where palsy shakes a few sad last gray hairs, where youth grows pale and spectre thin and dies, where but to think is to be full of sorrow, and leaden-eyed despairs, where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes, or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his pards, but on the viewless wings of poesy. Though the dulled brain perplexes and retards, already with thee tender is the night and happy the queen moon is on her throne clustered around by all her starry fays but here there is no light save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through verdurous glooms and winding mossy ways i cannot see what flowers are at my feet nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs but in embalmed darkness guess each sweet wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass, the thicket, and the fruit tree wild, white hawthorn and pastoral eglantine, fast fading violets covered up in leaves, and mid May's eldest child, the coming musk rose, full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunt of flies on summer eves. Darkling I listen, and for many a time I have been half in love with easeful death, called him soft names in many a mused rhyme. To take into the air my quiet breath, Now more than ever seems it rich to die, To cease upon the midnight with no pain, While thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such ecstasy, Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain, To thy high requiem become a sod. Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird, No hungry generations tread thee down, the voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the self-same song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth, when, sick for home, she stood in tears amid the alien corn. The same that oft times hath charmed magic casements, opening on the foam of perilous seas and fairylands forlorn. Forlorn, the very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my soul self. Adieu, the fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed to do, deceiving elf. Adieu, adieu, thy plaintive anthem fades, past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now tis buried deep in the next valley glade. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? The speaker of this poem, often thought of as Keats himself, is contemplating suicide as well as life. He is walking and hears a nightingale's song. This captivates him, and he stops to listen and muse over his thoughts. He longs to join the nightingale and leave behind all the unpleasantness of life. He sees the life of the nightingale and wishes he could join it. It is well known that Keats was facing death, and as he wrote this poem, his impending death could have had an influence on it. There is a lot of vocabulary to go through in order to fully understand this poem. Let's get to it. Hemlock is a poisonous plant, or a drink made from this poisonous plant. Opiates are drugs that induce sleep and relieve pain. Lethe is a river in Greek mythological Hades whose water causes forgetfulness of the past in those who drink it. A dryad is a deity or a nymph of the woods in Greek mythology. Vintage is referring to an aged wine. Tasting of flora refers to the drink tasting of flowers. Warm south is also referring to wine from southern areas. Hippocrene is a spring on Mount Helicon, sacred to the muses and regarded as a source of poetic inspiration. 
so the cup would be full of alcohol acting as poetic inspiration. Palsy means paralysis. Leaden-eyed means heavy-eyed or sleepy. Bacchus is the god of blinds, and pards refer to his companion. Starry fays are fairies. This is referring to the stars. Verdurous means freshly green. Embalmed darkness means preserved, undisturbed darkness. Darkling means in the dark. This seems to be used as a term of endearment, also referring to the fact that the nightingale is singing in the darkness of night. High Requiem is the mass celebrated in the repose or the attainment of peace for the souls of the dead. Sod is surf the surface of the ground. By becoming a sod, he is saying that he becomes a spot on earth when he is buried there. And plaintive means expressing sorrow or melancholy. This poem is written in eight stanzas of ten lines each. I separated the stanzas into different slides here. The meter of this poem is primarily iambic pentameter, as we saw in the first poem, but the meter in Ode to a Nightingale is not consistent. This is common in poetry. Meter is set up as a structure for the poem, but poets manipulate these patterns all the time. Here is a line from the poem that follows iambic pentameter strictly. That thou light winged dryad of the trees. Here is one that is different. Save what from heaven is with the breezes blown. This line is 11 syllables, as opposed to the 10 that most of the lines consist of. You can also see that there is a difference in the rhythm of this line. We have two iams, then an anapest, then two final iams. An anapest is a metrical foot of three syllables, two unstressed followed by one stressed. Here, the iam is, then is with, which I put into brackets for you to see. Also, the eighth line of each stanza is even more different. They are six syllables, making three feet, or a line of iambic trimeter. For example, in such an ecstasy. Each stanza's rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B, C, D, E, C, D, E. The first four lines rhyme alternatively, and the fifth and eighth lines rhyme, the sixth and ninth lines rhyme, and the seventh and tenth lines rhyme. I think the best way to understand this poem, since it is so long and full of details, is to break it down by stanza. The first action of the poem is the announcement of a state of discontent. This is the reason for the poem's existence and the theme of the entire ode. The stanza is very ambiguous. There are contradictions, even in the first line, with the aches and numbness and the pain. Aching pain and too sharp happiness imply that hearing the song induces the speaker to forget and also remember what is unhappy in life. There are abundant narcotic similes in this stanza, but the drugs do not have any power to soothe. Therefore, the problem that the speaker is facing is not a simple one. The poet declares that he is too happy, which brings us back to pain since the happiness is overwhelming. Sensory and emotional confusion in stanza one signify the extraordinary influence the bird's singing has caused. There is also a strong sense of vagueness, the speaker in this poem doesn't know where the nightingale is. He only hears him singing in some melodious plot. This vagueness is linked with the references to opiates, since opiates cause a sensation of haziness and uncertainty of reality. In the second stanza, the speaker begins to desire his own paradise. There is a movement inward and downward, and the intoxication that is referenced in this stanza appears as a pleasurable movement from the edge of consciousness towards some vaguely apprehended symbol of the poet's self. Wine is the natural counterpart to the potentially deadly depressants of stanza one. Here, we see the speaker beginning to long for what the nightingale is experiencing. He feels the opiate-like sensations of stanza one, but he longs for the sweet vintage wine that will take him somewhere else. The bird has begun to fly beyond the speaker's human reach in stanza three. It has never known the weariness, fever, and fret of the human world, and therefore it will always be above it. The nightingale becomes an emblem of some visionary world where the essence of pleasure is indestructible. As the speaker's longing for a mystic union with the bird grows, he realizes more intensely that the separation will always be between them.
In stanza four, the speaker reveals his hopes to reach a state of obliviousness that is equivalent to the nightingale's realm of pure pleasure. For this to occur, a means of escape more potent than wine is necessary. Keats writes, Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his pards, but on the viewless wings of poesy. Poesy is another word for poetry, so therefore Keats is saying that the only way to attain the feeling of freedom and happiness that the nightingale knows is to write about it and to experience it through poetry. As Barry Gradman puts it, this stanza dramatizes the power art has to transport us from mundane awareness to a finer visionary realm where the strains of existence are harmonized and disagreeable aspects of life are evaporated, reaching a unity of being. Stanza 5 illustrates a deeply attractive pastoral utopia, a serene world of natural fulfillment and freedom. The narrator is imagining this world as he can't see where the nightingale is. This is the place where he believes he would go if he were able to go with the nightingale. The wish of being with the nightingale signifies humanity's desire to achieve a new life of delight, uninfected by the knowledge of sickness and death. Stanza 6 is where the ode makes its essential turn. There is a break after the first quatrain and another after the eighth line. The first break shows verbal contrasts of unspecific phrases in the first quatrain such as half in love, soft names, and many amused rhyme. Then high emotional intensity in the second quatrain. Rich, cease, midnight, no pain, and ecstasy. This produces a crescendo effect that becomes the uh, climactic point of the poem. This stanza also reveals a profound sense of longing. The trance-like vision of union with the bird was itself a dull opiate, and he drifts to the point of no return, the contemplation of suicide. This has been prepared for with the images of burial in the entire poem, sinking leafwards, dissolving into the bird's plot of shadows numberless, relishing wine cooled a long age in the deep delved earth, luxuriating <clears throat> in the embalmed darkness, fading violets covered up with leaves. At this point of the poem, Keats embraces darkness for a moment. Then the mood is destroyed as Keats is brought back abruptly in the last couplet of the stanza. At the climax of the poem, the nightingale momentarily assumes the qualities of ecstasy which it seems to experience. This means that the nightingale does not know it is going to die, and does not fear death. The nightingale has no idea of the future, allowing it to live purely in the moment, and in this moment the bird is alive. This is the exact opposite of how the speaker feels. The speaker knows that death is inevitable, and is forced to live with that reality. He is desirous of the nightingale's freedom from that oppressive way of thinking, and in another way of looking at the immortality of the nightingale, you could say that the bird's song is changeless throughout the ages and therefore may be said to live eternally. But the speaker is mortal. The purely instinctive bird is constantly pouring its soul forth with its song, thereby perpetuating its identity. The poet m must let go of consciousness in order to know the beauty of this bird song at all. The speaker's experience has been strenuous, and the knowledge gained has been burdensome. In the final stanza, the speaker returns to life and says goodbye to the nightingale. He parts with more knowledge about life and a resolution to write poetry in order to come closer to the state he envies so much in the nightingale. But the problems and feelings that the narrator has been musing on have not gone away. The poem ends with a question. He wonders, is he awake or asleep? Gradman says that the imaginative trance and the poet's sub subsequent disillusionment had been wakeful or insightful, but the question of whether he is awake or not possibly is expressing fatigue or humility that was inspired by listening to the nightingale song. This is possibly the most dramatic and rhetoric of the odes. By ending in a question, there is no solution to the dilemma other than to live vicariously through the nightingale by means of poetry. The speaker simply dwells on his own thoughts and his experiences and compares them to the life of the nightingale then is forced to go back to his life at the end of the poem. Here are some sources you can use for further research on these and other poems by Keats. Thank you very much for watching this presentation. 
I hope that I was able to help you understand what is being said in these poems and give you some pointers on how you can analyze poetry for yourself. Best of luck.